Welcome everyone. I'd just like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners, the Wurundjeri and Boon Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation, on whose lands we meet, share and work here at ACME in the centre of Nam in Melbourne. I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and also acknowledge First Nations participants who might be joining us today. Uh, my name's Zoe, I'm a producer of school programs here at ACME, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you back for our second session in our series on demystifying AI. Today, we're talking about using chat GPT in education. If you missed the last uh, session, rather, you can catch up on the recording, uh, which will have been emailed to you last week, along with any of the answers that we um, didn't get through to your questions from last session. Um, and we'll do the same with the recording today. Uh, as with last week, we will have some time for Q&A at the end. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, so um, please uh, try and get your questions into the Q&A. And you can also upvote by clicking on an, a question that might be similar to one you have. Um, so I'd like to welcome back our AI expert, author, speaker, and consultant, Leon Furs. Welcome, Leon. Thank you very much, Zoe. Good to be back. Okay, I'm just gonna switch my screen sharing on. All right, well, welcome back. If this is uh, your second session and uh, hello, if this is the first time, as Zoe mentioned, do catch up on that first session, which gave an overview of artificial intelligence and programs like ChatGPT. Um, I'm just going to uh, dive straight in to the session today. When we're starting with a recap on session one, very briefly, just going over what we touched on in that first session, but then quickly getting into a slightly more practical approach this time around. And we'll be looking at a few ways that educators can use ChatGPT in their own workflow. Um, we're focusing on ChatGPT. Obviously, as I mentioned last week, uh, last time, sorry, there are many other applications of artificial intelligence. And we will actually cover some of those other applications in the following two sessions when we start looking at image generation, audio generation, and uh, video, and even 3D asset generation. But this time around, we're going to focus on ChatGPT because it's the easiest uh, program to use, really. It's, it's got a very low point of entry. It's very simplistic to use, and it's free to sign up for the free version. So hopefully what you'll take away from this session are some ideas for how to use prompts uh, to build into your own workflow as an educator. And it doesn't really matter whether you're in K to 12 or even in tertiary, uh, the, the kinds of prompts and techniques that we'll discuss are applicable pretty much across the board. So just to recap on the content of session one, and the point of this whole series is demystifying AI, because AI isn't magic, uh, no matter what uh, some of the companies behind the AI models might have you believe. It's really important, I think, in education that we um, we start to break down some of the barriers and some of the, the mythical and magical language that surrounds artificial intelligence. I don't think it's particularly helpful to uh, to speak about AI in that way, because at the end of the day, it is a technology built by humans. Uh, there are, as we talked about in the first session, a few ethical concerns with AI. And when we start to see AI as magic, it puts it as a level of remove away from some of those ethical concerns. And I think really in education, we need to be as, uh, as across those ethical concerns as possible. ChatGPT is really the crux of this session, and it is a language model developed by OpenAI. Now, last time around, I used this analogy to talk about ChatGPT. So a, a very quick recap on this analogy, because I think, again, it's useful to have a technical grasp without getting into too much detail about how these models work. Um, and there's also been some interesting uh, news since the, the last time we ran the first session about the, the data set component in particular, which I'll touch on in a moment. So just to go back to the analogy, that data set is the huge thing under the waterline, which really powers the language model. That data set is scraped from many, many parts of the internet, uh, mostly open access parts of the internet. So blogs, media sites, social media, and so on. 
that powers the language model, which is the algorithm that crunches through all of that data and uh, creates the predictive model. So uh, sort of like a, a supercharged predictive text. That's a very simplistic way of looking at it. But really what we're doing is we are creating some kind of meaning from that huge pile of text data. And then finally, we've got ChatGPT, the little snowman sitting on the top there as a refinement, uh, trained to act like a conversational chatbot. Now, even in the, the brief window of time since our last session, there have been some developments along these lines. Um, and in terms of data sets and things like that, which I'll just flag now because it's always good to keep up to date, even though this uh, industry moves very, very quickly. So the first uh, is uh, an article from the Washington Post. Um, I share a lot of these things on my LinkedIn profile. So if you are interested in following up, um, I've shared these links earlier this morning. But the Washington Post article spoke about um, a an issue which I think is particularly relevant to education, which is the data set that powers something like GPT is really uh, quite a sort of an, an average um, example of all of the knowledge that's out there in the world. And that's because it relies on all of that open source knowledge. So it doesn't have any knowledge in the data set that's behind a paywall or um, that's behind the uh, in the ivory tower of academia where we find this research sometimes. It doesn't have any proprietary information. And what we're seeing happen now is a lot of organizations in education. So I'm talking about big publishers like Pearson. Um, I'm talking about companies like Duolingo, Khan Academy, um, Coursera, Canvas. They're using these big foundation models like GPT-4, which are trained on the kind of average data across the internet. But then they're applying their own proprietary data into training their own fine-tuned models. So their own little snowman, essentially. And what this means is that we may end up in a situation where companies that have the most data are able to produce the most effective education chatbots or AI tutors, whatever you want to call them. Uh, alternatives to that might be companies like OpenAI and Google purchasing data from those uh, organizations and then building them into their foundation models. Uh, they haven't done that yet, but that's a possibility. Or um, people open sourcing or making their knowledge open access. So we know a lot of knowledge gets open access, um, but we know that in an academic context for people to publish um, open access journals generally costs the universities or the individuals publishing money as well. So there's a lot of complexities in pulling all of this data into these chat bots, which I think is uh, something we've got to be prepared to talk about in education. Um, so that's one aspect. Another interesting thing that's popped up in the news in the last couple of weeks is that the social media site Reddit um, was a huge source of training data um, for GPT models. Now, we haven't got any confirmation from OpenAI about exactly what it went into um, GPT-4, but it's a safe bet that there's a big chunk of Reddit in there. And Reddit's actually just changed its... Um, its pricing model and a lot of reddit users are now protesting and locking down their um their reddits and subreddits their threads uh, make putting them uh, into private mode essentially so what we've got now is we've got a uh, an economic imperative we've got reddit um, having to and uh, to make money we've got reddit blocking uh, these ai models from scraping all of that data we've got users protesting that because they don't want to pay a service that they haven't paid for before um, and knowledge again getting um, put behind um, put behind walls. So it's going to be really interesting, I think, to watch how this unfolds over the next few months and years as we're working with these models. What I want to talk about today, though, is this idea of AI augmenting but not de-skilling teachers, and just in the way that uh, you know the the. The big wealth of data in that chat GPT data set is fairly generic and sometimes prone to errors, just like I spoke about in the last session. When we're using them, we need to be really mindful that we're using these technologies in ways which uh, add to or increase our own creative capacities, which allow us to uh, improvise on the fly or which augment our capacity for, for planning and collaborating very quickly with one another. Eliminating redundant tasks 
um, not just making redundant tasks more efficient, essentially. So there is a bit of a narrative creeping out at the moment about AI replacing teachers. I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. Um, even with AI chatbots like the ones I mentioned from Khan Academy and Duolingo, uh, they still require a certain level of supervision. Um, they need somebody with expertise to help guide the students. Uh, a lot of them, increasingly, they're very fun. They're very attractive to young people. They're deliberately marketed that way. So we still need to be there with our critical eye on things, making sure that these applications are used properly. Uh, I've no doubt that these applications will be used in education. So I don't think it's a case of um, just turning a blind eye to this and, and saying, oh, it won't happen. Don't worry about it. Uh, I think we need to adapt. But I don't think it's replacing us anytime soon. Um, there's been a few suggestions in the media and, and around a couple of conferences recently that AI could and should be used for marking student work or uh, writing reports and things like that. And uh, frankly, I think that's a bit pointless. Um, I think one of the, the, the purposes of ed education and a teacher in the room with the students should be the teacher giving the students feedback. We might need to change how we do that or the way that we assess um, the kind of work that we're getting. But if uh, if students are using AI to write their work and we're using AI to market, then probably nobody's learning anything along the way. Um, when it comes to writing reports, then you know I spoke at a, a conference recently and um, gave the scenario where we know that parents are, are very busy. You know, many of us are parents. I'm a parent myself. Um, we know that sometimes if a school sends home a lengthy report, then it might not all get read. And I can envision a future where teachers, again, are using um, AI to generate reports, which parents are using AI to generate summaries of whilst they're on the drive to work. And again, nothing is really happening. So we've got to go beyond those kinds of uses. We've got to use the technology in ways which um, are extending the normal way that we are doing things as teachers, because we're the professionals. We've got the expertise. We know how to do the job of teaching. We just use these tools to help us do that a little bit more. Um, a little bit more easily and a little bit less friction there. So I'm going to talk about three areas that I think we can use these technologies responsibly as teachers. I'm not talking about using them with students today. So this is purely about you using them as educators, um, whatever area of education you work in. And I'm going to go through um, three prompts with each section and then give an example. Now, these prompts and examples, I've been running a similar session to this um, over the last few months that's been very popular with schools. Uh, and the reason I think it's gone down so well is they're quite simple prompts. Um, and again, there's no magic behind these prompts, but you can adapt them in any way you see fit. So what I would encourage you to do after this session is um, grab a hold of the, the, the recording and when that comes out and then just pause on the slides you can copy the prompts in verbatim, but it would be even better if you adapted them for your own use and uh, in your own context. And just straight away, start experimenting with what you can do with um, ChatGPT 3.5. Um, I can see there's a question in the chat, which you know we'll save all of the questions to the end about the paid version. The paid version does make the output um, slightly improved, but for most of the purposes, uh, 3.5, GPT 3.5 in the free version will uh, will do what you need it to do. Because you're always going to have to go over and fact check and probably build out whatever you get from ChatGPT. So let's take a look at those areas now. The first one is planning. And we've got three prompts on the screen. I'm going to just go through them all one at a time and then explain sort of why and how they work the way that they do. So the first one, lesson on this topic should meet the following outcomes. We copy and paste in the outcomes from curriculum documents, suggest learning intentions written in student-friendly language for an introductory lesson, which covers whatever. So one thing you'll notice is a bit of a thread running through all of these prompts is I do a lot of copying and pasting from other sources in the prompt itself. That little chat bar um, suggests short prompts, but you can actually put around about two to 3,000 words worth of text into a chat GPT prompt, um, which really opens up a lot of possibilities for when we're working with curriculum documents. So for example, you could take um, ACARA or um, Victorian standards from the curriculum. You could take achievement standards or performance descriptors, key knowledge and skills from the VCE. Um, you can take assessment standards from HSE, any 
kind of area that you're teaching in. And we can drop that in as part of a prompt like this one. This will give us learning intentions in student-friendly language. You could uh, adapt this prompt and ask for um, essential questions. You could ask for a series of questions um, that might be used throughout a topic. You could ask for assessment tasks and assessment items, or even a suggested outline for a, an eight-week unit of work for a given year level. The more context you put into the prompt, the better the result will be when you get it out again. The second is a little bit more involved. Uh, role play. You're a teacher in our faculty. We are currently in a meeting to discuss a unit of work on this topic for this year level. You are knowledgeable, but highly critical and a little cynical. Your role is to critique and question the unit plan, and we will type our responses. Don't provide ours, only yours. Here is the unit plan. So again, we're, we're giving it a unit plan. But we're giving it a lot more in this prompt. We're telling ChatGPT that it's a role play. We're saying uh, this is the role that you are playing. You are a teacher. We're giving it context, faculty, year level topic. We're giving it a persona, knowledgeable, cynical, critical. And then a job, critique and question the unit plan. The reason all of that works is because of that huge data set. A lot of data in there, which represents conversational language between people. Um, a lot of data in there, which is, you know, again, scraped from those social media sites. Also, a lot of data labeled um, with, with tone and the kind of language that's in there. So if you say critical and cynical, it's going to give you slightly harder edged responses than you might get if, uh, if you just asked it to ask questions about a unit, for example. The final one there suggests places where the lesson might bottleneck or become less engaging and suggest alternative approaches for the flow of the lesson. We give it a lesson plan. It's just going to look again at ways to uh, sharpen up a lesson plan, to refine that lesson plan. Always remember, you know, it's not magic, it's not thinking, but there is a lot of data in that data set that it can build a, a probabilistic response from. Um, which includes data on good pedagogy and data on interesting lessons and probably chat threads from Twitter between teachers. So all of this kind of data that's in there allows a, a model like GPT to predict a, a pretty reasonable assimilation of a approximation, sorry, of a, um, a human-like response. It's not human, not thinking, but it does a pretty good job of, uh, of pretending. This is an example of that role play prompt with the um, the 10 critical questions of, an, of a unit of work. So what I've got here is a year 10 unit of work on um, biofuels. I just took, a again, an open access unit of work on biofuels from online and pasted a few chunks of it into ChatGPT um, and fed it that role play prompt. So just take a look at a few of the questions here. So can you explain the reasoning behind only covering the case study of one specific biofuel production? How will this relate to the broader concept? So you can see they're quite critical of, of the unit and of the planning. What we have, though, is perhaps a, an extra perspective beyond our, um, our faculty group that we're working with. So I used to teach in a regional school. A few of the faculties were quite small. You know, you might be in a similar situation, you might be a faculty of one uh, and not have anyone to bounce ideas around with. Um, you need to uh, explore ways that you can use something like ChatGPT uh, in, in participation to bounce a few ideas around, always keeping that critical eye on the responses. So those are a few examples of planning with ChatGPT. What you could do to uh, adjust those for your context is just have a think about the kind of planning that you do in a normal teaching year, whether you do all of your planning at the end of the year in a staff week, or maybe you have a few staff professional learning days over the course of the year, or do you plan in your free periods? Um, do you get no time for, for planning? I know that um, if we've got any primary school um, teachers in the in the audience, you get very limited time for actual planning and preparation in between all of your teaching. And think of ways that you can take the jobs that you do in that time and offload some of that work onto ChatGPT. So are you creating rubrics? Are you creating lesson plans? Are you creating worksheets? Are you creating um, units of work or scope and sequence documents? 
any of that can be um, sped up a lot by feeding information like curriculum documents into ChatGPT and developing a few resources in that way. The next area that we're gonna look at is this personalizing idea. And the reason I've put this one into this session is because using ChatGPT for personalizing um, is becoming a, a really sort of hot topic. Um, one thing that um, I will point out at this stage is that we're finally starting to get uh, statewide um, policies around generative AI. So New South Wales have come out with their policy. Uh, South Australia, SACE have come out with their policy. Queensland, QCAA have come out with theirs. In Victoria, there's a community of practice running at the moment um, through DET, uh, which is cross-sectoral. So things are happening. We're getting a little bit more advice. Um, and one note of caution, um, resources for students, we never put any identifying information into ChatGPT. That being said, there are many ways that we could use this AI model to personalize or differentiate work. Um, I know from experience uh, administering parts of the curriculum side of NCCD that uh, those processes take a lot of time. So using them to create uh, parts of goals or ILPs, PLPs, and so on is a great way of um, making those processes a bit tighter. So the first one, reproduce this text at a level six flesh Kincaid grade level. Keep the original tone, style, ideas, and structure. Copy and paste in the text. So level six flesh Kincaid is just a, a reading level, which uh, gives you an average readability of a, a US grade six student. And what we could do for this is if you've got a conversation article or you've got an academic journal article, um, a worksheet, something from a textbook, and a student needs it to be um, brought down a level or two uh, because they have literacy issues, or maybe you just want to speed up the process of the lesson a little bit, and you don't want to wade through a really lengthy text, then you could use this. A student could also use a similar prompt like this themselves. So if they're 13 or over, according to the chat GPT terms and conditions, they can use it themselves. Um, at this stage, I'm generally advising schools not to um, not to charge in and make students sign up for ChatGPT or anything like that. I think your school's got to have pretty um, clear and solid policies around the use of generative AI before you dive into that extent. But you could certainly um, furnish these uh, your students with these kinds of prompts and they could um, experiment with them themselves if they wanted to. Create a list of five alternative assessment tasks for students who struggles with traditional assessments. These tasks should aim to assess the student's knowledge and understanding in a way that better suits their strengths and learning style. So we're, we're creating a personalized assessment um, pathway for a student. Uh, maybe we've got a student who um, has anxiety and therefore doesn't do well under exam conditions. So we need to do an adjusted examination. Um, maybe we've got a student uh, who's uh, not very confident with public speaking and we've got an oral, an oral exam. We could use a prompt like this to generate a few alternate pathways through that exam. Um, or, you know, maybe you have a student with a disability. Um, you may have a student who is autistic. You may have a student who is dyslexic um, and needs modifications for a given reason. And again, using this to suggest a few ways of modifying that task and then working with the student and determining which is the most appropriate for them. The last one with my kind of NCCD hat on, create a personalized learning plan for a student based on their strengths and interests. Uh, we don't need to give any identifying information there. We can just copy and paste in a dot point list of strengths and in interests with no names or anything. Outline the goals, activities, and assessments that will support the student's learning and development. So the example that I'm gonna give now is similar to that. Uh, this comes from one of my earlier blog posts. So if you go to um, leonfurs.com forward slash blog, you'll see all of the blog posts there. The most recent one is about those state policies, if you're interested in that. But in a much earlier blog post, um, I went through this whole process. You can see in the prompt here, it says using the above. So earlier in that thread, I'd taken a piece of research about inclusive education. I'd um, taken out the, the bits that I was the most interested in drop them into ChatGPT and said, summarize this research for me, and then 
um, come up with three practical ways I could use this in my year seven classroom. Building on that thread a little bit, um, and I'll talk about building on chat threads in a moment, uh, I've ended up with this prompt. Using all of the above, all of that information about inclusive education, create three goals from the student's perspective. And what I'll um, come up with is a student written or student um, student style first person goals. They probably would still need a bit of work. You know, they're a little bit too wordy for me. I think um, if, if I was a, a teacher looking at those sitting down with a student, I would say, oh, you know, they're not exactly right. But this certainly gives me a prompt to sit down with the students, maybe the students and their parents in a parent support group meeting or an, an NCCD data collection meeting and work through those goals um, alongside the students and the parents and with ChatGPT there in front of us. So one thing that ChatGPT is really good at um, in terms of personalizing resources is taking a lot of information in, synthesizing a lot of information and then giving you um, some kind of output. So taking in all the information about a student's interests, their strengths, their limitations, and then turning that into a, a cohesive set of goals is um, a really good use of the technology. Um, along that kind of personalizing narrative, we're starting to see that um, conversation I mentioned earlier around AI tutors and chatbots coming into that narrative. So they, they can potentially um, develop personalized learning pathways for students. Again, I still think it's the teacher's job to, uh, to guide some of that process because we know the students and at the end of the day, the chatbots don't really know anything. Um, they particularly don't know our students. They don't have relationships with the students. So the third and last area that I wanna demonstrate a few prompts with, and then um, I think I'll have about five minutes to do a live demo, um, technology willing. It's always a bit hairy when we go for a live demo. Um, is collaborating and we can collaborate with ChatGPT or we can use it to sort of augment our own collaboration with one another. So there's a few prompts here to do this. So these are my notes from a PD on whatever topic we copy and paste in the notes. Maybe you're taking notes on this PD or maybe you're gonna go away with the video and take a few notes on this and then turn them into an outline for a three minute oral presentation for my faculty. So again, a really easy way of taking something in one form, in this case notes, and turning it into another form, a three minute oral presentation, outline for a PowerPoint, um, article for a staff newsletter, whatever you like. And going backwards and forwards with ChatGPT in this way is uh, again, it's taking some of the workload off you, but it's also helping us to collaborate with one another. It's helping us with sharing knowledge amongst ourselves as educators. The second one, role play, you're a member of the school's senior leadership team and we're writing a policy about whatever, critically appraise the policy and then we throw in the policy draft. So working as a, a member of a leadership team, um, in an example I'll show you in a moment, you may um, be working on a, an AI policy or an academic integrity policy, for example, and uh, you just bounce around a few ideas there. And then the last one, maybe if we're collaborating with one another, uh, we might be doing a faculty retreat or a staff PD day where we're doing a bit of scope and sequence work, a bit of team building, and we want an outline for the half of half day. So uh, again, extending this out and just thinking about context where a prompt like this might be useful. You might be a faculty leader coming up with an agenda for a meeting. Um, you might have a, a couple of email threads between staff that you want to condense into some items for the agenda. So you take that email thread drop the whole thing into ChatGPT and say, turn this email thread into an agenda for a meeting for discussion. Or whilst you're working on these, um, these kinds of uh, days, you might be setting up a staff retreat that's uh, got a, a more formal part at the beginning of the day and you want an outline for the presentation that you're gonna do in that session. Um, if you're going on an excursion with students, you might throw a few details about where you're going on the excursion, come up with a bit of an itinerary for the day. So those are three areas that I'd like you to, to think of and, um, you know, planning, coming up with differentiation and then collaborating are, th are three things, which I know from my experience in secondary education for 15 years are three things that are really important, but that we get the least 
amount of time to do in schools because we're busy doing the actual job of teaching and giving feedback and, and all of the other business that goes along with working in a school. So I'm just going to switch over my screen sharing now to um, bring up ChatGPT. So you just bear with me for a moment. And what you'll see is um, GPT 3.5 and GPT 4. So I've got the plus subscription. Um, it's it's worth it if you use it extensively like I do. So I'm using it daily and using it quite a lot. It is $30 a month. Um, there's no business license just yet, although that is on the horizon. Whether that extends to an education license, I'm not sure. Um, however, there are alternatives. So uh, Microsoft's Bing chat which you can access through their Edge browser. If you download the Microsoft Edge browser and get Bing, if you use the creative mode of Microsoft Edge, it's essentially GPT-4, um, the paid version of OpenAI's GPT. Uh, it's not quite as good as this version, um, but it's almost there. Google's Bard is also free and uses its own language model. And of course, you can use GPT-3.5 um, with a free chat GPT account. So I'll just point out a few um, features in case you're not familiar with it. And even if you are, they are updating features all the time. So we've got a history down the side here um, where we've got all of our previous chats. We've got a new feature where if we um, are interested in a particular chat that we've been working on. So let's say, uh, Let's go, I'll go with one of my ones from a, a previous PD session where we were creating some, um, we created a fake student, Emily Johnson, and then we did some work on a personalized learning plan for Emily Johnson. If you look at in the left-hand side of the screen here, we can change the name of that to make it something more recognizable, or we can click this middle button here. And as of fairly recently, we can actually share the whole chat. So this is really good for collaboration. Um, I can copy this link here. And then in a new tab, I can, if I'm a colleague, I can open up that entire chat, um, static at first. So just a sort of a, a carbon copy of the whole chat thread. But then I can also click this continue this conversation button and it will um, load it up in my own version of ChatGPT. So that's a relatively new feature, um, but it's a, a very useful for our, our context. You could also share chats with students if you were going down that path. In the settings, there's a few other things I'll point out. So settings, we've got data controls now. So we can turn chat history and training off, which means that our data doesn't train future models. It's essentially an incognito mode for chat GPT. Um, we can manage the links that we've shared, turn them on and off. We can export the entire history of our chats and we can of course delete the entire account um, or clear all of the chat data without deleting the account. If you've got the plus subscription, that's where you unlock these uh, these beta features of browsing and plugins. So let me just show you a very quick example that sort of feeds off on um, the planning conversation I had earlier. We go with a very generic plan. We'll get a very generic response. Um, so generic prompt, generic response. Um, let's say create a lesson plan for a health class on uh, the UN goals, okay, really generic, really broad, pretty useless. <laughs> um, and that's what we'll get in response. We'll get a very broad and generic response. So um, lesson plan, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, grade level, high school, ninth to 12th grade, very broad subject, health education and objective. Um, it's given us a few kind of random things here. It, it warbles on, it's quite a long looking lesson for me. So we want to avoid that kind of thing when, if we're using this for planning. We want to do what I spoke about a moment ago, which is to use some really specific input. So in a new tab, I'm just going to um, very quickly Google, um, let's go with Victorian curriculum, health. Um, let's just go with that for now. Health and physical education, scope and sequence. And let's look at uh, levels five to 10 in the PDF here. 
And let's say we're at, we're at level seven and eight, so sort of year seven and eight level, and we're looking at uh, healthy and active communities, plan and use health strategies, resources to enhance the health, safety, and communities, plan and implement strategies for connecting to natural and built environments. Let's take these aspects here. So let's go with this one. And grab another one of those. And drop them in there. Okay. And then I'll just say use these level seven, eight Australian Victorian curriculum standards for health and physical education to suggest five assessment outcomes for a unit of work. It's always good to give as much context as possible and then to uh, perhaps ask for a few suggestions um, for outcomes so that you can choose which you think are, are the best outcomes here. So it's given as a range. Let's say that um, I wanted to focus in on this, reflect on personal community health practices and identify areas for uh, improvement. And I want to build that one out in a little bit more detail. I want to say uh, provide more detail for number five and suggest four lessons to deliver the, the content. Okay, and I'm, I'm just going on the fly here and I am not a health and physical education um, teacher. I've deliberately picked an area that I'm not familiar with um, just so that I can kind of go in cold. So it's given as assessment criteria, lesson one, lesson two, lesson three, lesson four. And let's say then um, develop lesson one into a complete lesson plan or a 45 minute lesson, a single 45 minute lesson for your seven students. And then it's gonna give us a much more detailed with learning objectives, what materials we need and the procedure and so on. So that was a very condensed um, run through and I apologize for the speed of, of going through that, but you can obviously watch the recording here, but really, what I've done there is just emphasize that it's a, it's a process. It's not just a one hit wonder kind of ask for a lesson plan and you'll get magic in return. It is a tool for working backwards and forwards. So I gave it um, specific direction from the curriculum. Um, I could have gone in in more detail. I could have used perform uh, uh, the, the descriptors rather than the achievement standards. Uh, I could have used um, specific uh, elaborations from the Victorian curriculum. Um, I've asked for assessment outcomes and I've asked for a range of options and then chosen the one that I liked the most. Then I've asked for some lesson plans in brief. And then I've said, okay, now we're going to develop um, this lesson plan in more detail. And I could go even, in, even further. So let's say we get to stage three sharing and discussion um, for the sharing and discussion stage. Um, suggest a visible thinking routine from project zero, you know, those project zero thinking routines, they're free, they're online, they're pre 2021. So they're part of the chat GPT data set in that below the waterline iceberg that I mentioned. Okay. And it's given a, it's given a see, think wonder from project zero. Um, that's pretty generic. Let's go for another, suggest another circle of viewpoints. Okay. That's a little bit more interesting in terms of a routine and then create a worksheet to support this activity. Don't need to worry too much about typos because it just rolls over the top of them. There we go. And we could take that. We could very easily copy and paste that into a, a Word document, a shared Google Doc, wherever we like, and use that to facilitate some of our discussion. Um, so hopefully that very, very brief run through there gives you an indication of um, how how I would use ChatGPT as lesson planning. So it is a dialogue, it is a back and forth. Um, remember that it's a chatbot. Um, remember that because it's trained to act like a chatbot, you're always best off uh, following through some kind of dialogue. Okay, so 
we've got the 10 minutes now for Q and A and I'll let Zoe field the questions at me um, rather than me trying to multitask and read the questions at the same time. If you have questions, please drop them into the Q and A part in Zoom. Thanks, Leon. Um, we have a question, I think you did answer it earlier about um, the benefits of using the paid version. Um, and I think you said it, you'd be pretty right with the free version for these sort of purposes, is that right? Most of the time, yeah. So um, I can see the question in front of me there. It's It does fall prey to high traffic sometimes. Um, so you'll find best results on this side of the world when America's asleep um, because they're the really heavy users. So, uh, you know, whatever that sort of 14 to, I don't know, 11 to 14 hour time difference is, if you can pick your window so that it's daytime here, um, then uh, you can get away with a little bit more there. The paid version gives a few more features. So you've got the internet access, um, you've got the plugins, although I don't use the plugins, they're still very much beta sort of early development phase and then, you know, they're not so much good. Um, but there are definitely um, times when you get a better use out of ChatGPT, the free version than, uh, than when it's peak hour. Um, next question is relation, in relation to the prompts. Um, have you trialled such an AI-informed lesson with face-to-face -face learners? And if so, how did it go? Example, the places where lessons might be bottlenecked or become less engaging. Uh, hi, Mark. I know you. Um, <laughs> we uh, what, what I'm doing at the moment, actually, is quite a lot of consulting work with schools who are um, e experimenting with AI in a lot of ways. So uh, I've got a student forum coming up with one school where we're going to get exactly that kind of feedback from the students, which is really important. Um, I haven't tried a, an AI informed lesson plan, but what I have tried is running um, units of work through the artificial intelligence and getting it to, um, to suggest places where I might've missed things. So some of my own blind spots. And I've noticed that it's, it's actually quite good at picking up on um, you know, areas where I might've missed um, uh, diverse voices of students or areas where I might need to modify tasks. Um, so I imagine that would be a really good use in front of students. But uh, by the time we do the third session, I will have done some student forums and I'll, I'll get the answer to that question directly from the students themselves, which I think would be much better than me just um, taking a punt on the answer. Uh, next question, what do you think of Google Bard? Uh, hi, Lisa, I know you as well. Um, Google Bard is not as competent as um, as ChatGPT at the moment. Um, possibly, I think, because of the, the guardrails that Google put in. So they've been really, really cautious and, and quite conservative with their models, um, releasing a model only when they're certain that it can't um, produce discriminatory outputs, where it's not as biased um, as, as GPT was when it first came out. Um, so in kind of computer geek language, they've they've nerfed it. They've taken some of the power out of it, um, which means it's just not as good as ChatGPT at the moment. But I mean, it's 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 Google. So to suggest that it won't be good at some point in the future, I think would be a bit ridiculous. Um, I, I've used Bard because it's got a few features that work really well natively within Google Workspace. So you can export a, a Google Bard chat straight into a Google Doc. Um, if you're a Google school, that's a really useful feature. Um, you can export a chat straight into a Gmail, um, into a blank email, which is also quite useful. And even the free version of Bard has the live connection to the internet now. So that's a feature that the free version of ChatGPT doesn't have. Our next question is, when ChatGPT doesn't work, I switch to Perplexity AI. Are there any other similar AI platforms you would recommend or others, uh, others are using? Um, yeah, I've used Perplexity AI. So that's built on um, the same model as ChatGPT. So it uses the same uh, language model in the back end. Perplexity is uh, quite good as a search engine with AI into it. So I have used that one. Um, I've used Bing Chat that I mentioned earlier, Microsoft's Bing, which again is the same model. And Microsoft Windows 11 is going to come out with Copilot soon, which will basically put um, Bing Chat style features into the sidebar of the operating system meaning you can use it in whatever app you're using at the time. So that's very soon. I think they're set to release that this month. Um, I have experimented with a couple of others. So Claude from Anthropic, um, which is a huge language model, uh, comparable again to GPT, but not, not as easy to access at the moment. And um, Poe, which is an app that you can use GPT-4, you can use GPT-3, you can use 
Claude. Um, you can use a whole range of models. Um, so that's Poe, like Edgar Allan Poe. You can download that as an app. Um, look, for me, because I've got the, the paid subscription, GPT normally works. But of all of those, I would recommend Perplexity and Bing as your next ports of call. Uh, next question. Do you always need to add contextual details such as Australian, Victorian, et cetera? I suppose this detail generates more usable results. Um, I, I would, yeah, because the, the bulk of the data in the data sets, um, the English language data is from an American context. So it will default to a very American style response. You'll notice it coming out with language like grades rather than year levels. Um, if you tell it that you're looking for Australian context, it, it's more accurate. And then if you give it the further context of the actual curriculum dot points, um, it's even better again. One thing it can't do is um, obviously ChatGPT has a data set which ends um, in 2021. So anything post 2021 isn't in that data uh, and you won't get curriculum that's been updated since then. But even with the internet connection with the plus version, um, I've found that it struggles to access curriculum pages. And I think it's because of the layout of the pages. There's a lot of clicky buttons and drop downs and PDFs, and it just can't read that information. So for me, copying and pasting is still the way to go. Um, how do you integrate technology and digital tools into your writing instruction to enhance student engagement, foster creativity, and develop digital literacy skills? <laughs> That's a big one. Um, <laughs> I'm running an entire session on that at the uh, AATE conference in a couple of weeks in Canberra. So if, you, if you're an English teacher and you come into the eight conference, you'll, you'll see the answer to that question there. Um, basically what, what I've been arguing for is, um, you know, we, we treat writing as a process and particularly in the English classroom, we, we talk about idea generation, we talk about um, brainstorming, uh, drafting, editing. So I'm looking for ways that prompts can be used at each stage of the writing process rather than to replace writing entirely can a student use it to generate ideas and then they do a bit of writing themselves and then they use it to help and i think really it comes down to the, the question what, what's the point of writing um, for me the point of writing should be to clarify solidify your ideas um, to help you organize your own thoughts the point of writing shouldn't be to assess somebody else's knowledge. Um, if we're if we're getting students to demonstrate their knowledge through writing, they can do that in other ways, orally, uh, through presentations, practically, through their practical application of the knowledge in ways that ChatGPT can't do for them. Uh, if we're getting them to write, it's because we want them to develop the skill of writing. So I think there are ways that we can kind of work through that whole process of writing. I've um, just got uh, about one more minute. So um, just a couple of questions that came through the chat. Um, can you drop other formats other than text, example, slides or images into chat GPT as prompts? Uh, right now, no, but uh, look, give it a few months. We know that GPT-4 that's sitting underneath chat GPT can be multimodal. So we know that it potentially can um, read images. It's got image um image recognition capabilities. They haven't released that publicly yet, but it's definitely on its way. Um, once that happens, you would be able to drop in a PDF of, of slides and images. Currently, there are things like chatpdf.com, which can you can upload a PDF of text and it can read the PDF and, and you can interact with that as well. But the multimodal feature is uh, it's definitely on a, on a fairly near horizon. All right. And we might have to wrap it up there. If there's anything that didn't get answered today, um, we will follow up in the email with the recording from today as well. Um, thank you so much, Leon, for another fantastic session. Um, our next uh, webinar you can see up on screen is Exploring Media Literacy in the Age of AI. So that's the same time, um, 3.45 Melbourne Eastern Standard Time on Wednesday, the 19th of July. Um, if you have any issues or questions in the meantime, please feel free to email us at education uh, at acme.net.au. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all then. Thank you. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thanks, Acme. See you soon.